So uh, I wanted to start by thanking you for having me come and talk to you this morning, because this is a, an issue that's of great importance to me. And I, I want to kind of walk through, uh, as you saw from the slide, I am the one of the people who works down at our Center for Prevention of Heart and Vascular Disease down at Mission Bay. And one of the things that we do there is w we often will have people come in to see us who have a family history of heart disease. And their first question to me is always, how do I avoid having a heart attack? How do I avoid following in grandma or granddad's or dad's footsteps? And so what I thought I'd do today is walk you through the whole topic of heart disease and heart attacks, particularly coronary heart disease, which is, heart disease, which is the most common cause of heart disease death, and talk to you about what a heart attack is and what we can do to reduce our risk of having a heart attack. Because what I want you to leave here with is the knowledge that most of heart disease is preventable. And it's preventable by things that are fairly simple things, although they're not easy to put into place in our lifestyle sometimes, but fairly simple things that can reduce the chance that we'll become one of the statistics of, heart, of someone with heart disease. So let's start. I'm going to try to go through a little bit about the magnitude of the problem. How, how big a problem is this? What do we mean when we're talking about a heart attack? Because I think there's often confusion about that. What are some of the known risk factors that we know contribute to your likelihood of having a heart attack? And then what can we do to reduce those risks so that you're less likely to become one of those statistics? And then finally, you know, as you're going to hear, about 80% of, heart, of, of cardiovascular disease is probably preventable, 80%, if we could get people to ideal risk factors. But that means that 20% we are not going to be able to impact very much, and that 20% is partially genetic. So I'm going to also, at the end, talk a little bit about if you happen to be in that unfortunate 20% who finds themselves in the middle of a heart attack, how not to have one, how to do it the right way. OK, so magnitude of the problem, huge, right? This is the number of people in the United States every year that have a heart attack or the, and the people that die of a heart attack. And you can see that at the younger ages, this is a very small number in people under the age of 44. But as you get up into the higher age ranges, the numbers go up. And in fact, over the age of 85, more women, for this is for all the women in the audience, more women die of heart disease than men at the older ages. And in fact, there are more cardiovascular deaths in women than in men every year. So here are, the, here are the statistics. So the top line here are women, this one. And here are the heart, these are the cardiovascular mortality statistics for men. And what you can see is that this is the line for men. And you can see that since about 19, 95, this rate has dropped off pretty well. And it has in women, too. But women still die in greater numbers than men do. So we haven't done quite as well in lowering heart disease death rates in women. This is pretty good news, right? We're going down in heart disease deaths. That's great. And it's probably attributable to a couple of things. One is better knowledge of smoking as a risk factor, and another is uh, the identification of the high cholesterol as a risk factor and the fact that more people are being treated for high cholesterol. But I'm going to tell you that there are some epidemiologists who are predicting that this curve is about to start to go back up again. And we're going to talk about why that is. Kind of as, as a corollary to that, this is where we, this bar right here is where we all are for our, all cardiovascular disease deaths combined. And this is the amount of cost in billions that we're now currently spending on heart disease. This is where it's projected that we're going to be in the year 2030. Well, wow, if I just showed you a slide that shows heart disease is seeming to go down, heart disease deaths, 
why are we going to have this astronomical increase in heart disease costs? And it is due to some of the rise in rates of obesity, diabetes, and hypertension that may reverse that trend and actually start to shoot heart disease deaths back up again. So what is a heart attack? And I'm going to go to the next slide. So this is your, this is your heart. And the heart is about the size of a fist, and it sits in the center of the chest and a little bit to the left. And the heart is a muscle. It's a very specialized form of muscle that has to contract 60 times a minute, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. There's no other muscle in the body that can do that. However, to be able to do that, the heart has to get an adequate supply of blood and oxygen through the coronary arteries, which sit over the top of the heart and feed the heart with blood. This is an artery, this is an angiogram, where we put dye into the artery to see where a blockage is. And you can see here, this is the normal artery here, and you can see that this is an artery that's been, looks like it's almost been pinched in. That's what a blockage looks like. That's what a coronary narrowing looks like. And this is the same artery after it's been opened up and a mesh tube called a stent has been implanted to keep the artery from closing down again. So how does this process all take place where you build up something inside the artery so that it gets narrowed? Well, this is a cross section of a normal artery and it turns out that there's an inner layer of blood cells in the artery called the endothelium. And research has shown us that the endothelium is critically important to keeping the blood vessel healthy. And that anything that damages that endothelium can then begin a process where the heart begins to, there's a, an area that's inflamed because of damage to the endothelium. And the, and the, the body tries to repair that damage to the endothelium, but it does it in some ways that aren't so great. And one of the ways it does it is to build up cholesterol, calcium, smooth muscle, and some other substances in the wall of the blood vessel. And that, when it develops, is called a plaque, right? So the nice, normal, healthy artery, and this is a diseased artery where you've had deposition of a, a lot of cholesterol, which is a fatty-like substance, a waxy fatty-like substance. If it builds up like this, you can see that this is blocking the, the channel that the blood can flow through, and it's blocking it by about half. If it builds up like this and the heart suddenly has to increase its pumping function, there may not be enough blood getting to the muscle to continue to pump normally and it can provoke what we call angina or angina pain. So that's what happens when the heart is not getting the blood it needs at the moment. What happens with a heart attack is that this plaque, something causes this plaque to crack. And when this plaque cracks, the body sees that as a damage. And just like if you were to cut your skin, the body says, up, oh, we've got to do damage control or we're going to bleed to death here. The body sends out a call to elements in the blood called platelets. And the platelets then come together and they stick together and they form the beginning of a clot. And so when that clot forms, if it forms on top of this plaque, if a big enough clot forms, it blocks the flow of blood completely through the artery and no blood can flow to the muscle. It turns out that we know now that there are several different types of plaque. Because, and, and one of the things that, that caused us to discover this was occasionally we would do autopsy studies on people who died of things other than heart disease. And we would see that they had a number of, of plaques built up in their arteries, but they had died of something completely different in old age, and they had never had a heart attack. And then we found that there were other people who might have a single plaque, but they had died of a massive heart attack. And so the question became, you know, were there different kinds of plaques that were more likely to cause a problem? And it turns out the answer is yes. 
So what we, we have come to a concept of the, a stable plaque or a vulnerable plaque. And the vulnerable plaque is the one that is the likely one to rupture and cause a heart attack to happen. What, is, what are the constituents of that vulnerable plaque? Well, you have a very big amount of cholesterol and lipid in the plaque, and it's covered by just a very thin little cap over the top of fibrous tissue. And it turns out that because there's just a thin covering over that, anything that injures that blood vessel wall again, such as a sudden jet of high blood pressure, such as carbon monoxide from cigarettes, uh, such as having an uh, abnormal endothelial um, uh, integrity because of diabetes, that plaque can crack more easily because this is nice and thin. And when it, usually, when it cracks, it usually cracks on this edge, right here or right here, and then the clot can form and cause the heart attack. In other individuals, they'll have very little of this cholesterol buildup inside, and most of it will be calcium and smooth muscles and scar tissue and those tend to be very stable and very resistant to cracking. So these are much, much less likely to result in a heart attack. So how do, we, how do we know whether somebody has this kind or this kind? Well, we don't quite know yet, although I will tell you that I think within the next five years, there's been a lot of work in CAT scanning and MRI scanning, and we are now able to determine the people who have this kind of plaque versus this kind of plaque, at least in, in uh, clinical trials. I think that that's gonna become widespread within the next five to 10 years, and we're gonna be able to identify people non-invasively to, to determine who is gonna probably not have an event and will probably live a pretty long, happy life, and who is gonna be likely to have a sudden heart attack. And this is an unfortunate, this is an autopsy slide. This is an unfortunate individual who had one of these unstable plaques. Here is where the lipid and cholesterol material was. You can see right on the edge of that thin cap is where the crack happened. And this is the clot that formed on top of that plaque, blocked the flow of blood through the artery, and the person had a heart attack. So what happens when that artery becomes blocked? Well, say the blockage happens here. All of the muscle beyond that area that should have been supplied with blood and oxygen dies. And once the muscle dies, it becomes replaced by scar. It can never be regenerated yet. There are some people working on techniques with stem cells to see if we can induce some regeneration there, but so far, once this muscle is lost, it's gone. And what does that mean? Well, that muscle is what's supposed to be contracting and pushing the blood to the rest of the body. If this is scar tissue, it can't do that, and you lose the pumping function of the heart. And depending on how much you lose, you may have significant disability. So that's the bad news, Those, that heart attacks, we, we know what causes them, uh, and we you know, have identified at least some initial things about which ones are more likely to crack. The good news is that we know that heart disease can be pre prevented, and estimates are that somewhere between 75 and 80% of all heart disease could be prevented if we could get people to adopt and get to ideal parameters for known risk factors. Reversal of heart disease is possible. We have proven this in both animals and humans. Once that, we, it, when I first started in cardiology, it was believed that once the plaque had been accumulated in the artery, the best you could do was to keep it from getting worse. It would never go away, but we know now that it will go away. That, through techniques like lowering the cholesterol, the bad cholesterol very low, we can show that you can get regression of coronary artery disease. The goal for us is, and the goal for me and my clinic, is to identify who is at risk, what risk factors people have, and then what can we do to modify that risk. And the treatments usually include me going through a pretty aggressive lifestyle inventory with that person, and then seeing where we can make some inroads in reducing the risk, either through lifestyle or through uh, medication. 
So it turns out there are some risk factors we cannot do anything about, uh, and we'll start with those. If you have a family history of early heart disease, and by that I mean if you have a brother or father who had a heart attack under the age of 55, that puts you at higher risk. If you had a mother or sister ha who had a heart attack at the under, age, under the age of 65, that puts you at risk. So what I, want to, what I want you to take away from that is that if you had a mother who died at age 90 of a heart attack, well, you know, 90, you've got to go of something, right? That doesn't put you at higher risk. It's people who have early coronary disease. Age is a factor. Uh, generally, we see that as people get into ages over 65, the rate of heart attack and heart disease goes up. So that, unfortunately, that's a function of aging, and we haven't figured out a way to get around that yet. Uh, race and ethnicity. There are certain uh, racial and ethnic groups that have a higher uh, prevalence of cardiovascular disease, and it may relate to their higher prevalence of some of the known risk factors like hypertension, obesity, and diabetes. And then sex, what do I mean by that? Well, I told you that women have more, end up in actual numbers having more heart attacks and more heart disease than men do in absolute numbers. But it turns out there is a difference between when people manifest with their heart disease. So men typically, we start to see heart disease rates go up at about age 45. Women, it's after the age of 55, and that's partly believed that estrogen may exert some protective effect until menopause, and then after that's gone, we catch up to men. Okay, so I, those were the things we can't do much about yet. Uh, but here is the list of things that we can do something about in places where we can really reduce someone's risk quite significantly. And I want to go through these one by one just to show you what's the magnitude of risk reduction we can get. So first and foremost, smoking. It is probably the biggest risk factor for cardiovascular disease. And this is a study that was done in 2000, and this was looking at a population of women Sorry, go back to that. These were, the, these were the never smokers over here. And there was an almost six-fold risk for women who smoked a pack a day over the people that didn't smoke at all. That's a huge increase in risk, right? And that's totally something that we can modify. But the reason I really put this slide up, and I'm not going to ask for a show of hands of who smokes, that's unfair. But, you know, I have patients who say, oh, you know, yeah, I have a cigarette every once in a while. I play my bridge game. I have a cigarette. I go to the bar. I have a cigarette. One to 14 cigarettes a day increases your risk significantly. Why is that? Well, remember I said that inner layer of the blood vessel wall is extremely important. And it's injury to that inner layer of the blood vessel wall that starts that whole plot, plaque building process. So we know that carbon, di carbon monoxide, which is one of the byproducts of smoking, and nicotine are injurious to the blood vessel wall. In addition to that, a single cigarette has been shown to activate the platelets and get them to be more sticky so that you're more likely to clot even having a single cigarette. So this is something where we can make a huge difference in someone's risk and there are good ways to get people off of cigarettes. One in five smoking related deaths is due to heart disease, heart attack and heart disease. Um, it, not emphysema, not lung cancer, but heart disease. The good news is if you can get somebody to quit, their risk within a year drops substantially, and by five years, the risk goes back to a non-smoker again. So you can hold that out as a carrot to people who are smokers. Another group of women who is that we really worry about are women who are taking birth control pills and smoking. Their risk is very high for having a cardiovascular event. And this just is to remind me to tell you that being around secondhand smoke is also a risk for having heart disease. About 40,000 people a year are diagnosed 
with heart disease that's probably related to secondhand smoke. These are non-smokers who were around somebody else that was smoking around them. Yes? I think in our clinic, in our prevention clinic, we do ask that question. We do ask that question about, were you exposed either as a child or as an adult, or do you work in a workplace where to smoking is still tolerated? I mean, we're lucky here on the West Coast. That's, that's kind of gone out, out of vogue in most workplaces, but you go to other areas of the country, that's still, you still see people smoking in restaurants and bars and that kind of thing. It does not, as a matter of fact. So that's, I guess, the good news for the, the proponents of marijuana. But it doesn't seem to have the same carbon monoxide, and, and it doesn't seem to activate platelets in the same way that cigarette smoke does. Dr. Thorson, if I may, and ask the group, and if you're in agreement, we have been asked to ask you to hold your questions to the end. Yeah, I'll leave some time at the end, and I, and I will also, I'll be happy to stay afterwards so that Great. if there are specific questions, uh, I'll be happy to stay. I have, I have plenty of time to stay and answer specific questions if you have them. Great, and thank you. And part of that is so that we're going to run around with microphones so that everybody can hear your good question. High blood pressure. So another big risk factor for heart disease. About, it's estimated that about 30% of us have high blood pressure. Probably only about 60% or 70% of people with high blood pressure are aware that they have high blood pressure. And if you look at a, a, a plot of uh, risk of heart disease with blood pressure, it goes up like this. So at every increased level of blood pressure, the risk of cardiovascular disease goes up. There are new guidelines that were just issued this year that have replaced the old guidelines that maybe some of you are familiar with. So we now define hypertension by age groups. So if you are under the age of 60, your blood pressure should be 140, should be below 140 over 90. Anything above that is considered hypertension. If you're over the age of 60, and this is the new thing in the guideline, it used to be that everybody had to be 140 over 90. Now the new guidelines have been issued that state that for people over the age of 60, uh, 150 over 90 is where we start treatment. I will tell you that this was the topic of huge discussion at the recent American College of Cardiology meetings, and there are a lot of people in the American College of Cardiology who do not believe that we should have raised it to 150 over 90. I think I'm among those, um, but we can have that. That's a separate discussion, but right now, these are the guidelines as they stand. Again, this is just looking at how many people at each age, and uh, blue is men and, and the lighter blue is, are women. You can see that at lower ages, oh, sorry, uh, went the wrong way. Uh, there we go, at lower ages, not too many people with high blood pressure. But if you look at the age group 75 plus, blood pressure tends to go up with age. 80, nearly 80% 80 of women over the age of 75 have high blood pressure and nearly two thirds of men have high blood pressure. So this is an important thing that we have to keep track of over the course of somebody's lifetime because just because your blood pressure was nice and low here doesn't mean it's gonna stay that way. In fact, it's more likely that it's gonna go up with age. Do we always have to put people on medicine when they have high blood pressure? And the answer to that is no. I always start with going through someone's lifestyle and trying to identify places where we can get blood pressure lowering with lifestyle change. So weight is a big one. Um, sometimes just the loss of 10 or 15 pounds can be the difference between needing a medicine for blood pressure or not needing one. Sometimes shifting someone's diet to a more fruit and vegetable based diet, lots of fruits and vegetables, non-fat dairy, low salt diet, you can shave several points of blood pressure off with that kind of diet. Increasing physical activity. So if you take somebody who's not doing very much physical activity and get them to do regular activity four or five days a week, you can lower their blood pressure by 10 millimeters. 
and limiting alcohol. One drink a day for women, two drinks a day for men. Now, if we can't achieve blood pressure control with lifestyle change, then there, as you know, there are hundreds of medications that we can use for blood pressure. But I always think it's worth trying to lower the blood pressure with lifestyle change. Well, what about cholesterol? I think this is one place where people have kind of gotten the message that having your cholesterol be too high is a bad thing. And again, like blood pressure, if you plot cholesterol levels with increasing cholesterol levels, the risk of heart attack and heart disease goes up. So these are the current guidelines for what are ideal and high risk cholesterols. And what I want to have you take away today is that it's not enough to know what your total cholesterol is. You really need to know both the LDL and the HDL cholesterol. Okay, and everybody gets these confused. So LDL is the bad cholesterol, and I tell my patients to remember it by lousy is LDL, and happy is HDL, and that's the good cholesterol. So LDL, as it turns out, is the one that is most de deposited in the blood vessel wall, the one that causes the plaque, or the one that's at least incorporated into the plaque. HDL actually works as a reverse transporter. It will actually pull some of that bad cholesterol, get it out of the plaque, and get it back into the uh, liver, and the liver can then get rid of it through the bile. So what you really want is a high HDL and a lower LDL, because that improves your risk significantly. So these are the desirable levels. Here it's kind of borderline in the middle and then high risk is on the, on the other side over here. So know your numbers. So, and this, sh this I'm sorry, we should read high cholesterol, hypercholesterol. So what do we do if somebody comes in and they have high cholesterol? Do we start everybody on drugs, statins? No, I don't. I, I try to identify what is it about that person's diet that I might be able to modify. One of the things that I don't think gets a lot of press, but Metamucil, which is ground psyllium seed, okay, so P-S-Y-L-L-I-M, ground psyllium seed, works to lower LDL cholesterol. It binds the cholesterol in the intestine, doesn't allow it to be reabsorbed into the blood, and most people can get about a 10% reduction in their LDL cholesterol, either by getting a tablespoon of psyllium and putting it in their oatmeal, or by just using a, a tablespoon of Metamucil and putting it in some orange juice every morning. So I have all my folks that are wanting to try lowering their cholesterol without drugs, I have them try to do that, and then we see, we recheck and see if that's been enough to lower their cholesterol. Obviously, there are really good drugs now. The statin drugs are very, very effective in lowering cholesterol. And there are a lot of people that feel that the statin drugs are partially what account for that fall off in cardiovascular disease rates I showed you earlier. The statins probably do more than just lower cholesterol, though. They probably exert an anti-inflammatory effect. And one of the uh, theories now of, of coronary disease or buildup of plaque in the arteries is that something happens to cause inflammation in that inner layer of blood cells and maybe we should be looking at anti-inflammatories as the next group of drugs that we use to target coronary disease. These, I'm not gonna go through. The, the, these are the newest guidelines that were published by the Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology. These are hot off the press. These replace some of the old guidelines. But basically, the people who are clearly in a statin benefit group are anybody who has already had some heart disease, they've already had a heart attack, they've already had a stroke, they've already had some disease of the arteries in their neck. Those people benefit from statins in terms of repeat events and repeat, repeat heart attacks and repeat strokes. Uh, other people that benefit are diabetics, people with very high LDL cholesterols. And then the final group are people whose cholesterol is maybe in that sort of borderline range, but who have a higher than normal risk of developing artery disease within the next 10 years. How do we identify them? We have a risk calculator that we can use. And in at the la one of the last pages of the handout that you have there, I've put in 
uh, a number of resources that you can go online. Almost all of them have that risk calculator online. And if you know your numbers, you can plug in your cholesterol, your good cholesterol, your, whether you're a smoker, what your, high, what your blood pressure is, and you can, it will tell you what your 10-year risk of heart disease and what your lifetime risk of heart disease is. And you can play with those calculators, and you can see what would happen if you dropped your blood pressure, say, from 140 to 120, or if you dropped your total cholesterol from 210 to 170, and it changes the risk quite significantly. So I put those, I put those resources in there for you so that you can kind of play with that. Okay, here's where we start to see the, the, the storm clouds on the horizon for those, those trends of heart disease going down, maybe going back up again. This is a study that was done in the mid-90s looking at obesity, and this was in women, but it's similar. The data is similar in men. And for those of you who don't know what the body mass index is, it's a way of uh, uh, relating your body weight to your height. And you can go on and Google, or go online and Google BMI calculator, plug in your height and your weight, and it will tell you what your BMI is. Normal BMI is less than 25. It's in the range of 19 to 25. Overweight is 25 to 30, and anything above 30 is obesity. You can see that at normal weight, the risk is relatively low of coronary disease. But as you start to get up even into the overweight range and clearly in the obese range, that risk goes up significantly. Here's the, here's the bad news. So, what, so we, we, we claim, and, and a lot of people dispute, that there's an obesity epidemic. But here is data that is collected every year by the CDC. And this is where we were, this is men and women. Here's where we were in the blue back in 1960. Here's where we are now. And this is percentage of the population that is obese. Okay, so in, in you know, 50 years, we've gone steadily up. If I were to add on to this, the percentage of people that are overweight and obese, two-thirds of the American population would be classified as overweight or obese. Two-thirds. So how do we combat that? Well, that's tough, right? Because there's a lot of stuff going on there. There probably are genetics at play there. There are feedback hormonal systems that are at play that are being studied in terms of how do we interrupt those feedback mechanisms so that we make the brain think it's full. But we also can teach people to eat healthier, eat more healthy food, and eat more normal proportions. One of the problems is we've supersized everything. Our dinner plates have become enormous. I had a dinner party where I had my young nephews and nieces, and I used my grandmother's plates. And they said, why are we using these tiny little plates? And I said, these are dinner plates. These were the dinner plates of, our, of my grandmother. You know, they're so used to having these gigantic plates and gigantic portions that we've lost all sense of what we really need to take in calorically to maintain our weight. So the, the diets that seem to be effective in terms of heart disease risk is, are ones that are kind of more toward what we call a Mediterranean diet. And a Mediterranean diet is, is uh, high in fish, and particularly oily fishes, Lots of fruit, lots of vegetables, beans, legumes, um, even olive oil as the, as the fat, because we do need to have fat in our diet, but we pr prefer to have monounsaturated fat in our diet. And limited saturated fats, cholesterol, and trans fats. So anything that has partially hydrogenated vegetable oil, that's just a synonym for trans fat. The Mediterranean diet, they did a study in Spain that was released last year looking at people who in Spain had a typical diet or just were allowed to eat whatever they wanted, which in a lot of Spain these days is McDonald's versus a traditional Mediterranean diet, high in fruits and vegetables, fish, uh, that, that kind of thing. 
And it was, the people who ate the Mediterranean diet had a 30% lower rate of cardiovascular events, strokes and heart attacks. Okay, this is also linked to the obesity epidemic, I believe. So we've become a nation of people who sit behind computers instead of a nation that exercises or at least gets physical activity regularly. But we know that physical activity can significantly reduce the risk of heart disease. It probably does it in a lot of ways. Um, it lowers blood pressure. It happens to lower cholesterol, lowers the bad cholesterol, raises the good cholesterol. It tends to keep blood sugar under control. Um, but it actually, you can with exercise recruit small blood vessels in the, the smaller blood vessels in the heart so that you can grow what are called collateral blood vessels. So if the major blood vessels become blocked, those collateral vessels can take over. And exercise seems to help that. So how much exercise should, or how much physical activity should we all be doing? Well, the current recommendation is that about 30 minutes of moderate intensity exercise five times a week, or if you're gonna do more intense exercise, you can probably get by with as little as 30 minutes three times a week, or a combination of those. And you know, the question is often asked of me, well, you know, I, I can't do uh, 30 minutes at once. Is it okay if I break it up into two segments of 15 minutes? And the answer is yes. You get the same benefit, or 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes. It seems that 10 minutes is the magic number, though. If you drop below 10 minutes, the benefit isn't the same. So if you're going to do a physical activity, commit yourself to doing it at least for 10 minutes, because th then you'll get the benefit out of it. We also recommend that people do muscle strengthening about two times a week. Why is that? Well, because as the population gets older and we don't do muscle strength training, um, we have people that fall, break hips, hit their head. So muscle strength training can combat that a little bit. In addition, you get cardiovascular benefit from muscular strength training. Not as much as you do from aerobic activity, but you do get cardiovascular benefit as well. What are, some, what are some forms of moderate activity? Dancing, raking leaves, gardening, pushing strollers, walking on a treadmill, walking outside, cycling, swimming laps, all of that counts as moderate physical activity. Now, if you're walking on the treadmill and you're really pushing your heart rate up and you're, really, you know, you're getting it up, and we could talk about target heart rates, but if you're getting it, your heart rate up and you're really sweating, well, then you can probably get away with doing a little less exercise. You probably don't have to do it quite as often. How many of us are actually meeting that goal? And this is, I think, an overestimate. 45% of men, 30% of women. I think that's an overestimate from, from my experience. How much, if we exercise, can we expect to reduce our risk of having a heart attack? This was a study done in women. This side of the slide, and you can see that this is walking or any physical activity. This side of the slide is the couch potatoes. These are the people who are doing nothing. Here are the people that were really exercising vigorously. So you can see that over here on this side, you got a, a little bit more benefit if you exercised really vigorously. But what I really want to point out is the biggest risk reduction is just getting off the couch and doing anything. Right? This you get a little bit more, but just getting off the couch and being even mildly active reduces your risk. And yet, we find that very difficult to do. What about diabetes? Well, diabetes is not just a problem of eating too much sugar. I think we all understand that. It's a very complex interaction of food, insulin, which is secreted by the pancreas, other hormones that are pancreatic hormones that, that uh, feed back. But we know that physical activity or physical inactivity and obesity are linked to developing diabetes. Genetics plays a role so that if you have a history of, a family history of, of diabetes, you are more likely to develop diabetes. But again, that doesn't mean you have to develop diabetes. 
So what, are, what do we use as definitions of diabetes? Uh, fasting blood sugar, fasting means not eating for 12 hours ahead of time. Fasting blood sugar of over 125 or a hemoglobin A1C of more than 6.5. What's a hemoglobin A1C? So if I draw your fasting blood sugar and I get a number back that says 110, that was your blood sugar at that moment I poked you in the arm. But what that doesn't tell me is, has your blood sugar been under good control over the last three months? Uh, and so what we can use the hemoglobin A1C to tell us is whether or not the blood sugar control has been, it has been good or whether it's been poor over the last three months. So if we get a number for fasting sugar that's borderline or elevated, we often will check a hemoglobin A1C to see if that was just that particular day that the sugar was high or whether this is a person that's evidencing diabetes. This is a very important group and growing group, right? The people who have prediabetes. So their fasting sugars are a little high, their hemoglobin A1Cs are a little bit higher than normal. And the reason this is an important group is we know if we intervene on this group here with changing the diet to have less carbohydrate, getting people to lose weight, getting them to exercise regularly, we may prevent these people from moving into diabetes, right? So very important to know these numbers. From a cardiovascular standpoint, diabetes confers a very significant risk for heart attack and stroke. Uh, diabetic women are about four times more likely than non-diabetic women to have heart disease and stroke. So it is a huge problem. And this is the, the, uh, in the vein of more bad news, this is the CDC's tracking since 1958 of the percentage of the population that has developed diabetes. And if you remember what the obesity slide looked like, this is a very similar trajectory, right? So we've talked about the risk factors. So if I could construct the ideal man or woman that would be at really low risk of having a heart attack or developing artery disease, who would that be? What would that person look like? Well, they'd have a total cholesterol of less than 200. Their blood pressure would be close to 120 over 80, and that's without medication, so that would be with lifestyle. Fasting blood sugar of less than 100. Never, a body mass index in the normal range abstinence from smoking, or at least having quit for a year, physical activity at the goals that we talked about, a Mediterranean or a DASH-like diet. The DASH diet is a American Heart Association heart-healthy diet that is very low in sodium. And I will tell you that by estimates that have looked at this, about 5% of the population is in this ideal range. How are we doing with getting the message out about reducing people's risk with lifestyle? Not so great. 1988, this was a big study looked at in, in 2009. 1988, 28% of the population obese, now 36. Smokers, eh, we've made a little bit more inroad, but I think we've, we've gotten the people that are gonna to try to quit. I mean, I think uh, still we've got a quarter of the smokers left to go. Regular exercise, way down. Healthy diet, down even more. So we're not doing very well. With things that are really known to prevent cardiovascular disease. So what I would urge all of you as being incredibly important to reduce your own individual risk for having a heart attack and developing heart disease and stroke and a certain form of cancers, know your numbers. You should know what your blood pressure is and you should keep a log of it. And I often will get my patients to go and buy their own blood pressure monitors which are relatively inexpensive, easy to use, and then you can monitor your own blood pressure at home without you know, the white coat in front of you, which sometimes increases people's blood pressure. 
Blood cholesterol, need to know both the good and the bad, because if we plug you into one of our risk calculators, if you have a really high HDL, you're very protected against heart disease. If you have a very high LDL, you're at great risk for heart disease. So it makes a big difference. Your sugar, you should know your sugar, and if your sugar is elevated, keep track of your hemoglobin A1C. Body mass index, we talked about, we want to be in the normal range. It turns out, too, that there seems to be some risk of where we carry our body fat. Um, people who carry their body fat mostly in their trunk or in their abdomen, uh, we call those the apples. Uh, apples are more likely to develop cardiac disease than pears, people who carry their weight lower down in their hips and thighs. And that is under our control. If we know that we're overweight and we carry a lot of our weight up in the abdominal area, that's modifiable with diet and exercise. And so I would say that I gave you some resources in the, the last sheet that you can go online, and if you know your numbers, you can plug in and get your own 10-year risk and lifetime risk of cardiovascular disease. If you're not adept with a computer, I, I will tell you, go in and ask your, your doctor. I want to know my cardiovascular risk. Can you calculate it for me? There are several dis different risk calculators that are well known, and most physicians are very familiar with them, and they can plug in your numbers and tell you what your risk is. I would urge all of you to be proactive about this. This is your health. This is your life. Uh, and if somebody's not giving you the help that you need, I would urge you to find somebody who can help you get that information, because this is very important stuff. Okay, so how do we lower heart disease risk? Well, start today, right? We've, you know, don't put off starting exercise or starting eating right till uh, after Memorial Day or after my birthday or what we see at the gym here, which is January 1. Everybody's here. I exercise upstairs and I recognize some of you from up there. <coughs> Be physically active. You know, the goal for people, if they're not using it for weight loss, if you're using it just to maintain your cardiac fitness, is 30 minutes of moderate activity five days a week. If you're going to use it to try to lose weight, it has to be longer than that. The experts tell us it has to be somewhere between 60 and 90 minutes a day. But again, that can be broken up into smaller increments if that's easier to fit into your day. Follow a healthy eating plan. We talked about the Mediterranean diet, which I think is a good one. Maintain a healthy weight. There are some new little gizmos, which some of you may have heard about. I happen to have one called the Fitbit, um, which actually you can go online. It will tell you for your height and weight and age how many calories you will typically burn in a day. And then you strap this little thing onto your belt, and you wander around all day and do your exercise, and it tells you whether you've burned off all those calories or not. So you get feedback at the end of the day about whether you're, you're taking off the same ca your ta calories that you put in. Pedometers are really great. The American Heart Association has a 10,000 steps program. If you're doing 10,000 steps a day with one of those little pedometers clicked to your waist, you're, you're getting a lot of physical activity and you're burning off a lot of calories. And then finally, stopping smoking and avoiding secondhand smoke. And there are good ways to do that. Well, so all of this stuff sounds really simple. You know, it sounds simple, but the problem is it's really hard to make behavioral change and institute and, and integrate this into your life, right? So you, you have to look at this not as a, I will go on a diet till I lose those 10 pounds and then I'm gonna go back to eating the way I did because you'll just get those 10 pounds back. It has to really be, I'm going to start eating healthier and I'm gonna get a healthier pattern of eating that I can eat this way for the rest of my life and I know it's gonna be healthier for me and reduce my risk. Set realistic goals. If you're a couch potato, which many of us are, I said, you know, the goal is 30 minutes, but don't start by doing 30 minutes if you haven't been doing anything. Start by making your goal five or 10 minutes a day. And then every week, add another five minutes onto that until you're up to your goal. You know, you can get discouraged if you start out trying to do 60 minutes of exercise and you can also hurt yourself and then you won't go back. 
uh, buddying up, getting a, getting a colleague or a friend or somebody who wants to start a walking program with you. There are a couple of reasons. One, it's more fun. Number two, you're accountable to somebody. And it's more likely that you're going to go to the gym or that you're going to take your walk or you're going to do that if you've got somebody else that's kind of depending on you to go with them. I talked about some of the fitness devices. Fitbit is one. The pedometers are another. These are ways to kind of help keep us motivated. Personal trainers, you know, uh, they're expensive, but the reason they work is because people have to be accountable to a trainer. They pay money, and they've got to go, and they've got to meet with the trainer, and they're accountable. So for some people, that works to help keep them motivated. Don't worry about a slip. We all have them. I have them. There are days when I just say, oh, well, you know, I'm too tired to go to the gym today. But then what I do is I make sure that in the next day or two, I'm back doing my routine, and, and then it becomes more of a habit. And in fact, I get, I'm to the point now where I don't feel as well if I don't get my exercise routine in. And then I would just say, be your own advocate with your physicians. Be, be your own advocate. Demand the information that you need to make wise choices for yourself. I think if, you're, if you don't have that kind of relationship with your doctor or they dismiss you, I think there are plenty of people out there who are interested in prevention and interested in helping you get the information that you need and working with you. Okay, so I started out by saying that 80% of heart disease is reversible with some of the things that we just talked, or is preventable with some of the things we just talked about. But that means that 20% of it isn't preventable. So I want to present a case, and this is a patient that I actually take, who is actually a patient, who is actually a patient of mine and consented to have me talk about her. Uh, and I, I just want to, uh, the title of this talk is How Not to Have a Heart Attack. And she identifies herself as the way not to have a heart attack. So I'm going to go through her story. So her, her initials are MH. She's a 59-year-old woman. She developed a sensation, as she was at home, sitting at home, developed this sensation of chest heaviness. And she had some discomfort in her neck, like somebody was reaching up and kind of grabbing or, or gently squeezing her neck. She started sweating a little bit. And so she took some antacid. She thought maybe this was heartburn. And she went to bed. And over the next several hours, the pain kind of came and went and came and went, but she didn't get really relief. And the next morning, when the symptoms got worse, she called her neighbor and she said, I think I need to go to the emergency room. I feel kind of silly because I probably just have the flu, but I think I better go get checked out. So her neighbor kindly got her in the car and started driving her to the hospital and she fainted in the neighbor's car. Now she fainted. So remember that I said that when the, a heart attack has set up in an area of muscle, there's some electrical instability that goes on in that area. And one of the things that can happen is arrhythmias of the heart can set up in that area that is now in the middle of a heart attack. And some of those arrhythmias are potentially fatal. So that about half of the people with heart attacks, uh, people with um, heart attacks uh, that die of the heart attack don't ever make it to the hospital. They die suddenly of an arrhythmia before they ever get there. So she fainted in, her, in the car, which almost caused the neighbor to have a heart attack. But they made it. She came around. And in the emergency room, they hooked her up to an EKG, and it was clear she had sustained a large heart attack. She then arrested in the emergency department and had to be shocked and was taken up to the cardiac catheterization laboratory and had an angiogram which showed that the main artery at the front of her heart was 100% blocked. And they took a large clot out of that artery and put in a stent. Unfortunately, unfortunately, the horse was already out of the barn. 12 or 14 hours had gone by and the heart muscle was irreversibly damaged. So how could she have done this differently? How could she have done this differently to minimize the amount of damage that happened to the heart? Because remember, I said time is muscle. Or, you know, so 
chest pain, and I would describe it not as pain, because I think when we say pain to people, they think of a sharp, stabbing sort of th discomfort. That is not the discomfort of a heart attack. It is more often squeezing, pressure-like, heavy, as if somebody laid a heavy weight on your chest when there's nothing there. And those are the most common symptoms for both, both women and men. Now, women may be more likely to have some atypical symptoms, but I have seen these atypical symptoms in men too, so it's important to be aware that they can happen in both sexes. Unusual upper body pain, and in particular pain that kind of is in between the shoulder blades, a heavy sensation in between the shoulder blades in the back. Sudden shortness of breath without doing anything that should be causing you to be short of breath. Nausea and vomiting like my patient had. Unusual or unexplained fatigue. And this, uh, interestingly, this can be present for two or three days before the actual heart attack happens. So it's probably that something's going on in that blood vessel. Maybe some platelets are sticking together and then they're dissolving and then they stick together again and then they're dissolving until finally a big enough clot forms that it blocks the artery. Breaking out into a cold sweat, which my patient did and lightheadedness or sudden dizziness. And this could be related to some arrhythmias. I'm just about done. Two minutes, one minute? I'll wrap it up. This is what to do if you think you're having a heart attack. Do not wait. Do not wait. Call 911 within five minutes of the symptoms if you can, because the longer that artery is closed, the more muscle you're going to lose. And if you lose a lot of muscle, your heart isn't gonna work very well. Chew an aspirin, not a coated aspirin, but a regular aspirin. Don't drive yourself to the hospital. My lady had an arrhythmia in the car. She was lucky she didn't die in, in her neighbor's car. You know, if you have 911 and the paramedics, they can deal with those kinds of situations. And make sure the paramedics drive you. Don't, don't argue with the paramedics. They're supposed to take you to the nearest hospital to get that artery open as fast as we possibly can. So don't argue with them that you want to be driven over to all to Bates, because that's your favorite hospital. <laughs> Uncertainty is very normal, right? Don't worry about that. The way we make a diagnosis of a heart attack is to get an EKG, look at it, and get some blood tests that show us that an enzyme is leaking into the blood, which signals heart damage. You can't do that at home. I can't do that over the phone. That requires you being in a hospital. So call 911. We're never sorry to say to somebody, you know what, everything's great. We got the EKG, we got the tests, they all look fabulous, here's what we're gonna do next. That is a great scenario. A bad scenario is what I have with my 59-year-old patient who's now lost literally half the muscle function of her heart and is quite disabled. So I would just urge you, don't be embarrassed to call 911. And I just wanna, I guess I'm going to finish here and say that these are the resources. Go onto these websites. There's a wealth of information on here. And here are my contact numbers. If anybody needs to get more information, I'm happy to share it. And these are the information numbers for UCSF to get referrals. Thank you very much for your time. We are going to take a few questions, is that not right? What's that? I think we're going to take a couple of questions. Oh, okay. We have, we have changed our plan, so if you have questions, if you would just go up and personally ask the question, that'd be great. Thank you.